Okay, let's get started. But before we start, who has a copy of this book? Anyway, yeah, well, if you're here for the last one, you get another chance. Uh, so, there's one free copy of this book going, and my really sophisticated way of choosing a winner is just tweet an aha moment or something you found interesting about the talk, uh, and the tweet with the most RTs at the end of the talk wins. Uh, make sure you tag hashtag DevOpsPL and beyond GWT so that I can find them. That is all. Let's get started. Who uses behavior-driven development in the current teams? A few who use Cucumber. Are the people who use Cucumber the same ones as use behavior-driven development? Are they the same thing? See, I do a lot of work with teams adopting BDD and uh, often I hear a lot of interesting conversations about BDD because you may have heard BDD is about conversation. And sometimes I get conversations like, yes, we do BDD. The tester does all these test scripts in Cucumber. Or sometimes I hear, yes, you do BDD, cool, I love test automation. Or we're dev complete, let's write some BDDs. Now that's a way to get a BDD specialist to cringe, to use BDD as a noun, just a pro tip. I have heard this recently, we couldn't do BDD in this print because we didn't have any UI stories. Or the JIRA story is not complete until the, the BA has written the acceptance criteria with given when thens. Do any of these ring any bells? Well, in this talk, we'll have a look at why there are some, this is not necessarily the optimal way of doing BDD. Uh, because there's a lot more to BDD than just writing given when then requirements. So BDD is not just using given when then in your requirements. So the format can be very useful at times. BDD is most definitely not Cucumber. Cucumber is a useful BDD collaboration tool if it's used right, but the fact that you're using Cucumber does not mean you're doing BDD. Uh, BDD is not test automation, though test automation may be useful when you're doing BDD. Behavior-driven development is a collaboration practice. It's about having conversations around concrete examples, around business rules, with the aim of delivering better software. Is that something, am I sort of stating the obvious there? I'm sort of assuming that's fairly well known. Yes, no, maybe who, who, would, who would say that is a fairly obvious statement? A few, who would say it's news, it's a bit of a revelation? Who is in the nebulous state of being somewhere in between? A few people. So from my perspective, behavior driven development, it's not really this, there's no bad way of doing BDD, it's what gets the job done, but there are better ways of doing BDD. And often when you see the way people try and implement BDD, you say, yep, you could probably do this differently and you'd probably get better outcomes. Or they'll try to do BDD in one way and they say, no, this didn't work for us, so BDD doesn't work. And that's a little bit sad because there are some really, really nice ways of making BDD work for you. And that's some of the things we're going to talk about here. So BDD is all about collaboration. It's about collaborating to discover requirements and uncover uncertainty. Those two things are really important. You don't get given requirements, you discover requirements. And you do that by using rules and examples talking about rules and examples at multiple levels and building up a shared understanding. And that shared understanding is actually probably the most powerful thing that comes out of BDD. It's not the test automation. Test automation is sort of like the cherry on the cake. It's the shared understanding that gives BDD its power. 
if you want to do something well and focus on an area to improve, that's the first thing you start with because it's a lot cheaper than getting good at test automation. And the shared understanding will help you lead on to knowing whether you're actually delivering software that matters. And we can take that conversation a long, long way, way beyond just delivering stories. So, BDD, apologies to anyone who was in the previous talk. There are, there's a little bit of duplication in the slides. BDD is basically about talking through a scenario or a story, talking through a feature and coming up with the examples, the rules and the acceptance criteria, but above all, coming up with a shared understanding of what you're trying to deliver. And from that shared understanding, you get your executable specifications that will guide your development and verify what you've built and help you deliver working code. And you can think of that as a cyclical process with a certain number of phases. It's not linear as such, but you do get these cycles. The first phase is discover. You're discovering your requirements, discovering what you don't know. In any project, it's always a journey of discovery. What you know about a software project when you start is that there will be stuff that you don't know. And the tricky bit is knowing what you don't know. And knowing that you don't know something and then looking into that area so that you can reduce your uncertainty. When you've got a bit of a higher idea, we call this a breadth first approach. So you discover what you need, discover your requirements, get a high level understanding. Then you go into a more detailed, detailed look at a particular feature or particular capability that you want to build. So you go into your, what we call the define phase. So in a, we might call this the specification by example, or the three amigos, or the requirements discovery workshop. No cucumber yet. Then you formalize. Once you've defined what you want to build, then you can actually formalize it. Another useful thing to know is there's no point formalizing before you define because you'll formalize the wrong thing. If you can't nail what you have to do, if you can't nail your understanding in the defined phase, the gherkin won't help you. You'll just be formalizing something incorrectly. Because there's such a thing as being precise but being wrong. You can be precisely wrong. You can specify the wrong thing in a very precise manner and give yourself a false sense of security. So that's why we don't go into Gherkin too early because you'll be formalizing too early and being precisely, running the risk of being precisely wrong. Once you have formalized, then it becomes easy. You automate and you deliver. Now, now it's not easy, but from the perspective of this talk, that's not the complicated bit. That's not the interesting bit. Now, where does Gherkin happen? Gherkin happens in the formalized stage. So you can see it's quite far down in the process. And Cucumber happens in the automate phase. So, Gherkin is a really useful format. Don't get me wrong. Gherkin does a great job of being a central source of truth for BAs, for testers, for devs, for product owners. If you write it well, it's a lovely, unambiguous and testable way to express your requirements. Here's a nice one. So I'm assuming everyone's sort of familiar with Gherkin, with Cucumber, yes? More or less. So this is a simple scenario where we show what rule we're illustrating, we give a precondition, an action, and an expected outcome. A very simple example, yeah? Or we could make it more complicated. It's not really more complicated. We're just using a table with several examples, but you can see how we're describing why we want to do this feature, 
We're describing what the feature does and we're describing how it actually does that and we're giving a set of examples. So I'd say if you're on the project with that sort of requirements, if you look through the Gherkin scenarios and the Gherkin feature files, you can get a reasonable idea of the business rules and how it's going to be tested and what it's meant to do. Yeah? Would you, uh, would you consider that reasonably readable? Yeah, I think that's not too bad. That's what I'd call sort of the living documentation side of Gherkin. And you'll notice the scenarios, we've just got a given when then end three or four lines. That's all, all you really need to keep it simple. The tricky thing with Gherkin is just that, keeping it simple. Because you saw that was easy to read. I don't know whether it would be easy to write for every team practicing Cucumber. Because writing good Gherkin actually takes a lot of time and takes a fair bit of skill. It's not that easy. By the way, if you do have any questions, please ask them when you have the question. So do you get what I'm saying when I say Gherkin, if it's easy to write, it's going to be hard. E if you, no, if it's uh, easy to read, it's actually quite hard to write. Gherkin that's hard to read is easy to write. We'll see some examples later on if you have any doubts. Here's one. How do you compare this one to the previous one? This is a real world example. I'm not even going to bother to try and read it. Has anybody come across Gherkin scenarios like this? Yes. Often this is what happens, and this actually came from Jira. This is what happens when BAs write requirements using Gherkin in JIRA. They'll basically, if they're coming from a non-BDD background, oftentimes they'll just write traditional requirements and put given when then around the paragraphs. And that just makes more work for everyone. So this is what I call when given when then happens too early. And it's a shame because it's a lot of effort to write that sort of structure. It's not natural to write that. It would be way easier just to write plain English. It would be way, way easier in that case to do a wireframe. There are easier ways to do that sort of requirement than a given when then structure. So it's a lot of effort and it's not necessarily effort that actually pays off. I mean, if it was a huge effort, but then the developer said, well, that's really easy to work with, thank you for that, we are eternally grateful, might, it might be all right. But usually developers say, what the hell is this? I'm going to throw it away and just interpret my rough interpretation of the requirements and let the testers sort it out. Has anyone been in that a project where you get that sort of thing going on? Yes. <laughs> so basically the more dense, or the more words that go into a Gherkin scenario, the less readable it is and the less useful it will be. But there's worse. There's a thing called anchoring. Does anyone know what anchoring is? If you go to buy a used car, you go to the car, and say, how much is a car? And they say, well, a car's 5,000 euros. And you're going to say, 5,000 euros? You must be mad. And then you'll start negotiating. 5,000 euros is your anchoring point. If he'd said 2,000 euros, what would you have said? 2,000 euros? You must be mad. 
So the anchoring point is the point of reference in the start of a conversation and everything else in the conversation is judged on that point. In requirements gathering, you get the same thing. You go into a requirement, a three amigos meeting, a requirements discovery workshop, and the BA says, this is what's going to happen. This is the solution I want you to implement. So how much flexibility do you think you'll get there? How many other alternative solutions do you think people will come up with? None, because that's the solution you have to build. We'll build it, fine, thank you. Next. But that's not what the requirements discovery is about. The requirements discovery is the BA coming in saying, we have this problem to solve. What is the best way to solve it? And that's not what happens if you get Gherkin in the JIRA. So we take this example. One of my favorite cucumber samples code. The old login example. I say that with great irony, just in case anyone would not miss, would uh, misconceive what I say. Uh, login is possibly the worst ever example. And I know what Liz Keough agrees with me and she wrote J behave. Uh, so this is not a good example of what you do with Gherkin or Cucumber or J behave or any of those tools. But why not? What's wrong with it? I've, you've just been exposed to anchoring. <laughs> So you're starting to think in terms of positive and negative scenarios around this requirement, which is what happens when you get presented with a requirement like that. It's the way our brains work. We're wired to do that. You can't do anything else. But the problem is not what's here. It's, not, it's more what's not here. OK, given I'm a registered user, I log in, then I should not be able to log on with invalid credentials. Whoopie doo. Any half-rate developer could be able to figure that out. But what else? There's no feature. What are we trying to... Yeah, there's no feature. What are we trying to achieve by logging in? Why do we have to log in? Do we have to log in? Has any user ever said, as a user, I want to log in? No, because logging in is a huge pain. Nobody wants to log in. That's why we have touch on the iPhones. Logging in is awful. We'll do everything we possibly can to find a different way of authenticating other than logging in. So why are we assuming that we need to log in with a username and password? So again, this is your anchoring. The BA has decided the only way I know about to authenticate is login and password because that's the way we've always done it. So the requirement is you need to log in with a username and password. And so let's go through the usual things of what happens when you enter an invalid password and so forth. You're also not looking at what happens if the user account expires, what happens if they forget their password, what happens if the user gets blocked. They're the sort of conversations you want to be having, not this sort of level. Does that kind of make sense? <laughs> because that's very common. It's easy to fix, but it's very common, this problem of requirements happening too early. But requires, you can also get Cucumber happening too late. And if Cucumber happens too late, what happens is you get Cucumber being used as a test automation tool. And what this means is that you have testers who are basically saying, this Cucumber stuff is really cool, let's automate with Cucumber, and they start writing things like this. Now, just as an aside, Automating, writing automated tests with Cucumber for the sake of writing automated tests is not necessarily a bad thing if you know why you're doing it. But if you try to do BDD with it, it's a really bad thing. And if you're doing stuff like this, it's a really bad thing because that is impossible to maintain. 
It's also, can anyone figure out what it's doing? It's not what you call immediately obvious, is it? Again, this is a real example. Uh, from teams who have since learned the error of their ways and do really nice Gherkin scenarios now. Uh, but this could be summarized, this could be done in two or three lines of proper Gherkin. But if you start from a test automation perspective, then the automatic tendency will be to write this sort of low level scripts because you're focusing on what you're doing, not why you're doing it. Or in fact, really, you're focusing on how, not what. And our brains do that. We can't focus on several layers of abstraction at the same time. So if we start talking about usernames and passwords and error messages, then we're suddenly set at that level of abstraction. It's very hard to go up. It takes a lot of effort to consciously step out of that layer and think at a higher level. And when you do test automation, the natural tendency is to think in terms of clicking and buttons and so forth. But that's not what it's doing, it's how it's doing it. So now that I've rubbished Cucumber, I'm not actually rubbishing Cucumber, I'm just saying there are ways of not using it optimally. Uh, there is a better approach. And how do we get to this better approach? Where we think in terms of what BDD is trying to achieve. And BDD is trying to achieve a shared understanding. That's the heart of it. You want to build up a shared understanding. If you can get everyone on the same page, everyone understanding not what they're delivering, but why they deliver it, then you have huge leverage. Just getting that understanding can reduce your bugs by 80, 90% without doing a line of automation. Yeah, probably you don't have any regression tests afterwards, but that's a different question. But just this shared understanding is hugely powerful. And the shared understanding comes from two sides. You have the collaboration, where you establish the shared understanding using conversations and examples. And then you have the formalization, which validates the shared understanding. Now, the collaboration is what happens before sprint planning, leading up to sprint planning in your requirements discovery. It does not require Cucumber or Gherkin. And the validation is what happens during development. That does require something more formal because that's your automated tests, your automated acceptance criteria, your ex executable specifications. And that's where we do the Gherkin, we'll do the Cucumber. And when we do these sessions, you can think of basically there are three roles in a requirements discovery session, or there should be. The first is the advocate, the person whose job it is to present the problem and not the solution. Then it's the skeptic, the person who says, this won't work. Or what could possibly go wrong? from a technical perspective. Then there's the cross-examiner. How can we prove it works? How could it fail? You need those three roles. And most, so typically, the advocate is the BA, the skeptic is the developer, and the cross-examiner is the tester. They've all got different perspectives. Sometimes you can have three amigos workshops where there's more than three people. I like to say it's three where three is a number between three and seven. I once went to a meeting, I said, okay, everybody who's concerned by this feature, who's interested in this feature, should come to this requirements discovery session. I go into the room, there's 16 people. That's slightly more than I expected. But still, they were all interested, so they were motivated. Yeah, it was good. And so if we go back to this, little diagram, our discover phase, how would that actually work? So let's walk through how this would look if we're not using, not diving into Cucumber, not going straight into given when then. What would this look like? 
First of all, we might come up with a requirement, ordering a credit card online. In order to save time and avoid paperwork, as a retail banking customer, I want to be able to order a credit card online. Yeah, fair, sound fair enough? It's actually a, probably an epic or major feature. It's probably pretty massive, but still. For the example, it would suffice. But since it's a fairly big one, a large feature, epic sort of level, typically at an epic level or at a whole application level, we're typically going to start by looking at the larger picture. So I'm not sure whether anyone's ever done techniques like impact mapping or event storming. This is the time when you do that. Has anyone done impact mapping? Impact mapping is basically a mind mapping way of going from a business goal and figuring out what capabilities could possibly deliver that business goal and why and how likely they are to work and what the underlying assumptions are. We'd also do story mapping at this level. Anyone done story mapping? Yep. So story mapping is, well, that's a Jeff Patton technique from 2006. I won't dwell on it too much, but it's quite a useful technique for breaking down epics into stories and flow through the application. So that happen, all happens at the higher level. But if we get into the stage where normally you'd see Cucumber, at the sprint stage, at the sprint planning and pre-planning stage, the defi define phase. At this stage, we're going to start to think about what are the outcomes? What are we trying to achieve? Now, if you're using behavior-driven development, we start from the outcomes. We start from the outputs. Chris Matz likes to say that the value in a system comes from the outputs, not from the inputs. There's no value in a screen. This value is what the screen enables you to do. So we start with what we're trying to achieve. So we, we, in this case, we want to achieve, we want a customer to have access to online banking, to have a credit card sent out, and to have a terms and conditions document that has to be sent out because legal says so. There are our outcomes. But we also might start to think about some concrete examples and business rules around how that would work. So if we think about concrete examples, what sort of examples might there be for ordering a credit card? So we've got Joe who's rich, he can order his credit card. I ask Bill, Billy, he's a student, he can't order a credit card, he's not allowed to. So we've got some concrete examples. Notice there's no given when then there, they're just examples, plain text. Say, oh, there's a business rule in there. What's the business rule? Well, there's something about the salary must be sufficient because if your salary's not high enough, you don't get a credit card. And there are others as well. There are also credit checks and so forth. So this would be typically where we do example mapping. I'll show you these techniques a little bit later on, but this is where looking at example mapping and feature mapping here. So once we've got our example, rich guy Joe, how would that play out? What sort of flow through the system would that involve? So we can break that down, we can say, okay, well, he applies for a cart, his credit rating's okay, his salary's okay, so an account gets created and a credit card gets posted off. So you can see the high-tech approach we're using here, known as post-its. This is a technique called feature mapping. And it's basically a way of fleshing out our understanding of what's involved in a story or feature. And we might continue then and say, okay, well, we understand for rich guy Joe, what about student Billy? Well, he applied for a card, his credit rating's okay, 
but his salary is not sufficient, so he doesn't get a credit card. And if you're looking at those examples and that line, that last line, what other flows might you be able to see there? Sorry? Yes, what if it's a, a, a dodgy character who has a bad credit rating? So Fred's a dodgy character. Fred applies for a card and his credit, his credit rating is bad, so he gets rejected. So he just found another case by looking at that flow. Now, he might not have thought of that case if we'd just been going straight into given when thens. But because we're not worrying about the syntax of given, when, then, and so forth, we can just think in conceptual terms. We can just think of business flow, of rules, and so forth. So we'd say, his credit rating is bad. That's another business rule. He has to have a minimum, uh, a minimum um, score in the credit rating. So this all happens before the formalized stage. And what I just showed you is hugely powerful because you can get a, very, a lot of requirements analysed. You don't have to do the Gherkin just yet. The Gherkin slows you down at that stage. If you're doing feature mapping and example mapping, you can go way faster and get a shared understanding. Then afterwards, you go and take that shared understanding and you write your Gherkin. But you don't do it with the whole team. You can do it just with two people. And then you review it in the sprint planning. It's only that once we've got the shared understanding that we actually formalise it. Do you see the difference with going straight into Gherkin? So it's a very gradual process, in fact. And then you're at a point where you can automate it and you can run your tests. So the techniques I've just shown you are example mapping, which is... Uh, uh, a technique from Matt Wine about exploring examples and rules. And in example mapping, we basically deal with stories, we come up with business rules around those stories, and then we explore the examples of those business rules. So what we say is examples illustrate rules and rules explain examples, and you can't have just one or the other. Traditional specifications just have rules but they don't have examples to make it real. And the examples help us flush out other rules. They also help us ask questions. So we've got a special colour for question cards uh, where we can flag something that we don't know. So that's example mapping in, a, in 30 seconds. But it's, there's a bit more to it than that, but it's a very simple technique and still very powerful. Feature mapping is similar, except we focus more on the flow through the application. Example mapping is very broad. Feature mapping is a little bit more detailed, and it's good for finding those variations. So in feature mapping, we start with a story. We might find some rules and some examples, but we break an example down into a flow. And then we can break several examples into different flows and see how they vary. And from variations that we see in the flows, we can find other examples and other business rules. And it's quite nice because we can actually split that out into several different stories that we could deliver in a f for a feature. So if we find that the feature has lots and lots of rules, it might be too big to deliver in a single sprint. So we could split it out by rule. That all makes sense. So these are techniques that all happen before we get anywhere near the Gherkin. Nice thing about the feature mapping, though, is that if you look at those green cards, and if you put a given and a when and a then in front of them, what do you get? You get Gherkin. You go straight from the feature map flow into Gherkin. But the Gherkin will be in business language 
and not in terms of clicks and enters and uh, UI details. It'll be in terms of business flow, which is what you want. So this is a very nice way, not only of building up that shared understanding, but of also getting a fairly fluid passage to nicely structured Gherkin. So the way I see it, there's when you adopt a process like BDD, you go through several stages. This also approach for DevOps, but it, approach, it actually works for lots of things. At the first level, basically everybody's working in their corner. Everybody's working separately. So we call that silo. So you got your BAs over here, developers, then testers. When you start to adopt Scrum, if you're doing it well, then you'll be co-located. You'll have the BAs, developers, testers together. So you start to reduce, so break down those silos, reduce the bottlenecks associated with these silos. But what behavior-driven development is about, and what these techniques are really good at helping, is getting teams engaged. So there's actually a whole lot of psychology and facilitation techniques around engaging a team. It's not a mechanical process. The idea of using example mapping and feature mapping is to avoid anchoring, which is one of the many biases which can get in the way of getting that shared understanding. There are other techniques like brainstorming. Everyone knows brainstorming? Brainstorming is rubbish for creativity. Brainstorming is actually a really, really bad technique if you want to generate ideas. And what are we trying to do here? Generate ideas. And how does a requirements discovery session normally happening happen? Brainstorming. Yeah? Or some sort of variation. Sort of free for all people talking. Uh, there are lots of reasons that I haven't got time to go into that that's not a good way of getting everyone engaged and contributing. So one thing we do, for example, with feature mapping and story mapping is we alternate between individual activities, I mean, in the same room, but everybody will write down rules and examples they can think of, and then collaborative activities where they go and present them and review them and criticize them and find the best ones. And we find that can be massively more productive and get people more engaged. So there are, this idea of getting the team engaged is non-trivial and very important. So once you get the team engaged, then you can start to think about getting them mechanized. Now, mechanized means they're actually automating the executable specifications. You're doing Cucumber. You'll notice engaged comes before mechanized. There's no point automating before you're engaged. Otherwise, you'll be automating a whole lot of stuff which may not be relevant. And you'll be wasting time. You won't be able to prioritize. If you're engaged, you'll have, your automation will be a lot more efficient. Now, if you get beyond the engaged, the mechanized stage, you get to what we call the pioneering stage where you have that shared understanding, you've got enough space so that you can actually start to do beyond what the customers ask for and start to give features that actually surprise the customer, that do more than the customer actually uh, need. To, you can actually do more innovation, innovative work. If you're even beyond that, then you get the customer on board, the customer starts to experiment, to say, oh, well, what if we tried this? What if we did this? Well, I think if we tried this, then that should have that outcome. Can we test that? And that's where you want to get to. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Uh, if you want to know more about this sort of stuff, there's a book. There's another book coming out, which will be more on the sort of stuff we'll be talking about. Uh, there's also a newsletter uh, on this site where I publish my various thoughts on this sort of topic from time to time. So I think we can move on to questions. Has anyone got any questions?
Did anyone tweet anything? Should I look to see if anyone's tweeted? There's a signed book ups for grabs. Oh, there are some tweets. Okay, so the winner is Igor Kokos. Is he still here? Sorry? Igor K O K O Z. Okay, so the next winner is uh, that's going to be really hard. I'll just get to screw it up. So it's Woj uh, Tech W O J T E K. Yep, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Okay, have we, uh, yes, question? Is it large data? Or the question is, is there any, a, merit or advantage of doing Cucumber for mathematical calculations or applications involving mathematical calculations. So the question is, my question is, is it to do with large data or is it just input and output? So if it's big data, can you know the output that you're expecting? If you've got input data and you know what the expected output data, then yes, the general approach, whether it's Cucumber as a tool, uh, it would depend on the implementation, but as an approach, BDD can work. Uh, the tricky thing with big data that I've seen in some places is that uh, sometimes you don't know what you're going to get until you actually put it through the process and you say, well, I thought it would give this result. It actually gives this result. I can figure out why, but I didn't know what to start with. In that case, BDD is not that great. You're in what, in the Kinefin terms, you, you would be in a comp complex space rather than a complicated space. If you're in the condition where you can figure out what you're going to get, then BDD is something you can, uh, you can consider. Now, whether you automate it is another question as well, because automating big data has its own challenges. So the Gherkin, I may have mis-expressed myself, the Gherkin does come from those specific examples. Yeah, the Gherkin scenario, but the significant, they are expressed in business terms, but the Gherkin, the actual scenarios are from those examples and flows that we saw towards the end. Yes, that would be too specific. If you were at that level, it would be a unit test. You get to the point where, and you could use something like Jasmine or a JavaScript BDD tool to do those tests, but you wouldn't do it as an acceptance test. That's, that's kind of my point. You'd, if you're doing login, you're thinking about the interesting things that you want to discuss are the things that will 
reduce your uncertainty, reduce your ignorance, make you learn something. There's not a lot to be learned from a username and a password, and if you get the password wrong, you never a message. You could do that at a unit test, it's pretty obvious. Where can you learn in that scenario? We can say, okay, well, authentication, that's a given, we've got that, but what else could happen? So that's what I mean by the specifics. And as a caveat to that, it also there's a degree, to, it depends on the maturity of your team. If your team's less mature, you'll tend to do more lower level scenarios. When your team's more mature and you're more confident in the unit testing capabilities and how well they understand the problem space, you get more high level scenarios. Yes. The actual writing of it, like I said, writing them well is hard. Writing them, reading them is easy, but writing them is hard. And writing them to be automated, you need to actually have that automation knowledge. So what we do is we get the whole team getting to those example mapping and feature mapping, and then there'll be a tester plus a developer or a tester plus a BA who'll pair to actually write the Gherkin scenarios. Often a BA is involved, but not writing them alone. The BA will pair with the person who's going to do the automation. I'd say if I had no green fields authorization to do anything, I'd move everything to Cucumber because you get a lot more free uh, flexibility. Because the, thing, the other thing with automation with Cucumber is that you don't have to have the application written to start automating. The automation starts at the start of the, at the sprint with some, any of the uh, sort of heavyweight automation tools, you have to wait to the, the application or the feature is delivered before you can start to think about automating. But we're, when you do it with Cucumber, what you do is you, or a tool like Cucumber, is the developers will be running those acceptance tests in a pending state during the sprint, they don't wait for Jenkins. They run it locally as well, and they'll get it passing locally. And they'll get it partially passing locally. And so it's a much more fluid process. If you're, using, if you're not doing that, the problem is you tend to have a more siloed approach. Yes, one last question, I think. Feature mapping and example mapping are techniques that emerged after this book, but the general approach is in the book. Yep, the feature mapping and example mapping, that, that'll be in the next book. Sorry? Uh, within the next six to 12 months. Thank you.